All right, well, let me just remind you as we begin, because this sermon, like last week's sermon, is just a little bit different than what I've kind of been accustomed to doing, which is, you know, give you an introduction and to sort of align us to a particular topic and just kind of break that down. We're, we're actually working our way through a text which has been given to us in, in the Bible for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, you know, one of the reasons, of course, is especially when we're looking at the kings of Judah, is to see how these kings actually do fail, uh, realizing that they are sons of David and that the Lord has made a promise to David to seat one of his descendants upon the throne and to establish his kingdom forever. The question that's going to be uh, raised in, in the, uh, you know, the lives of the Jews, the faithful, is, is this son of David that son? Well, I think they, they very quickly show us they are not that particular son, so that's one of the reasons. But this particular, uh, particular text this morning uh, zeroes in on an account in Asa's life where he fails to do something that he should do. And so it's given to us as a negative example. Uh, don't fail to trust the Lord the way that Asa did, because there are consequences when we fail to trust him, but there are blessings if we will trust him. And so we need to trust him. These are the ones the Lord is looking for. So what we're going to do is just go through the, the text. I'm going to read the text, then we're going to go through the text. I'll make applications as we go through, and then we'll get to the main point at the end. But the main point is going to be expounded this evening. So there will be application uh, throughout this, but the main application waits for the evening. So, let's look at the text, Second Chronicles chapter 16, and I want to read for you verses 1 through 10. In the 36th year of Asa's reign, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa brought out silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the king's house and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me as between my father and your father. Behold, I sent you silver and gold. Go, break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. So Ben-Hadad listened to king Asa and sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they conquered Aijan, Dan, Abel, Mam, and all the store cities of Naphtali. When Baasha heard of it, he ceased fortifying Ramah and stopped his work. Then King Asa brought all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber with which Baasha had been building. And with them he fortified Geba and Mizpah. At that time, Hanani the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Aram... And have not relied on the Lord your God. Therefore the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. You have acted foolishly in this. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. Then Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison, for he was enraged at him for this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. Now, if you don't know anything or remember anything about Asa, this may not seem so unusual, but when we read about what Asa was actually like, this is unusual. This is out of character for him. And what we want to see is how he basically failed, how he fell. So let's, let's take a look at uh, this passage this morning. Let's consider the context of this passage and look at some of the background because there's a lot going on here that we, we don't really understand unless we read uh, the, the account in Kings. Okay, so what's going on? Well, essentially this, the Lord had blessed the southern kingdom of Judah with revival. This is during the time of the split kingdom. We had the northern kingdom of Israel, that's Baasha, and we had the southern kingdom, and Asa was the king at that time. But the Lord had brought revival to the southern kingdom after a time of, of prolonged spiritual darkness. I mean, towards the end of his life, remember, Solomon had turned from the Lord 
and fallen into idolatry. I know sometimes it's hard to believe that regarding Solomon. He's the one who wrote the book of Proverbs. And we don't think he was ultimately lost because of this, but he was worshiping false gods. And he did that because of the influence of his many wives. Remember, he had married, I think he had 300 political marriages and 700 concubines, all of which were his legal wives, but he married these foreign wives for political reasons. And in order to pacify them and keep them happy, he set up shrines to their gods, and he eventually began worshiping them himself. Now, let me just remind you what the New Testament says about the unequal yoke. If we are believers, we are not to marry unbelievers. And the reason we aren't is because we're light and darkness. We're so completely different. We want to honor the Lord. They don't want to honor the Lord. And that's going to bring struggles to the relationship. And it's also going to bring temptations, temptations to compromise for the sake of peace. That's essentially what Solomon was doing, wanted to pacify his wives. So just, just be reminded, first, Solomon's life stands to us as a warning not to compromise. It stands as a warning to the, to the truth of what the Lord tells us in 2 Corinthians 6. Now, his son, Solomon's son, Rehoboam, really didn't do any better than his father. He had the chance to repair the damage that his father had done when his people came to him asking for relief because Solomon had made their labors very, very difficult. But as you remember, he refused to listen to the advice of the elders. When the people came to him, he said, Come back in a few days, let me talk to my advisors. So he talks to the elders who counseled his father Solomon. They said, listen to the people, give them what they want. They'll be your servants forever. And then he gathered around himself those who were the same generation, his peers, the young men. And he said, what should I do? And they said, you tell them. You think my father was bad? I'm going to be a lot worse than that. Okay, so in other words, scold them and press them and so forth. And the result was the kingdom was split into two kingdoms. The Lord tells us we need to listen to wisdom. We need to listen to his word. We need to listen to those who come to us with his word, not to those who tell us only the things we essentially want to hear. We can always find somebody who's going to agree with what we want, but we need to listen to what the Lord tells us is the right thing to do. So if we want to be wise, we need to listen to wisdom. Now, that was Rehoboam. His son, uh, Abijam, and in the book of Kings, he's called Abijah, followed Rehoboam's example. We read in 1 Kings 15, verses 3 and 5, and here we're just, again, tracing the downward spiral of Judah into darkness. He walked in all the sins of his father, which he had committed before him. And his heart was not wholly devo devoted to the Lord his God, like the heart of his father, David. And again, David was not his direct father, but his, let's see, what would be great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather. But for David's sake, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem to raise up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem because David did what was right in the sight of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. Remember Bathsheba? And Uriah was Bathsheba's husband. David had him murdered. He took the man's wife. And that was a very serious sin. But in all the other areas, David was a man after God's own heart. God had made a covenant with David and had made a promise to him to seat his descendants upon his throne. But even during times like this, when the kings of Judah failed to trust the Lord, when they failed to follow the Lord, the Lord continued to be faithful to them for the sake of his servant David, because of that covenant that he had made with him, to preserve the Davidic line until he would establish the kingdom of David's greater son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did the Lord put up with these people? It's because they were his children by covenant and because he made a promise to send the Messiah into the world. That's why he preserved this line. So God is faithful. Okay, we need to remember God is faithful. God is going to do what he says he's going to do. And that's the reason why we need to trust him. Now, Abijah, or Abijam, did not trust the Lord, and his unfaithfulness cost him. He reigned a total of three years in Jerusalem, and then he died. So again, downward spiral. Solomon, Rehoboam, 
uh, Abijam or Abijam. But Asa, now we come to Asa. Asa was different. He trusted the Lord. Now here's where we get a little bit of insight into who this man is who didn't trust the Lord in the particular text we're looking at. We read in 1 Kings 15, verses 11 through 15, Asa did what was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. He also put away the male cult prostitutes from the land and removed all the idols which his father had made. He also removed Maacah, his mother, from being queen mother because she had, had made a horrid image as an Asherah. And Asher, by the way, is the female fertility god of, of Canaan, and this was a stumbling block to the children of Israel, Baal and Asherah. Their interaction, Baal the man, Asher the woman, through their interaction, they believe fertility came. So this, this was idolatry. Asa saw it as idolatry. He got rid of it. Asa cut down her horrid image and burned it at the brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was wholly devoted to the Lord all his days, except in the case of what we're looking at this, evening, or this morning. He brought into the house of the Lord the dedicated things of his father and his own dedicated things, silver and gold and utensils. Pay attention to that because that's what he's going, we've already read, he takes out of the house of the Lord in order to bribe Ben-Hadad. Okay, so because of the Lord's grace in Asa's life and his mercy towards David and his people, Asa made God's worship pure again in Judah and that brought God's blessing upon his people. Things were, were basically prospering in, in Judah. Now, sometimes we're tempted to think that the way to ultimate blessing, the way to ultimate happiness, is to travel the road that everybody else takes. You know, to take, travel the road that Baasha was taking or the kings of the earth. Just pursue wealth and accumulate wealth and, you know, basically all the things that your heart could desire. But we need to see that true blessing and happiness comes from no other place but the Lord's. And when we do the things that please Him, that's when He blesses us. He blesses us with blessings that those who are outside the church in the world cannot understand. But those who know Him understand it. And those are the things they choose more than the things of the world. So again, Judah had fallen into this downward spiral into declension, but the Lord had revived them under Asa. Now, what were things like in the northern kingdom? Well, the northern kingdom also had become idolatrous. Rehoboam, remember, refused to listen to the Lord, to the wisdom that his elders were giving to him, and he divided the kingdom. And when that happened, the Lord gave Jeroboam, who was the former head of Solomon's labor force, ten, the ten northern tribes as an act of discipline against Rehoboam. By the way, it was also against Solomon because of his idolatry. But because of the Lord's love for Solomon, he wouldn't take it away from Solomon during his lifetime, but said he would take it away during his son's lifetime. So his idolatry is what brought about this situation, and the Lord was dealing with it. Now, when Jeroboam became king, the first thing that he did was he set up an alternate religion, the same Basically, the same idolatry that, I, that Israel had fallen into when they first came out of Egypt. Remember what they did when they came out of Egypt? They made the golden calf. And remember what the Lord thought about that? Well, Jeroboam, the first thing he did was he made two golden calves, and he put them in two places in the northern kingdom, one in Bethel and one in Dan. And he commanded his people to worship God through those golden calves. And the reason he did that was because if the people went to Jerusalem to worship in the temple that Solomon had built, their hearts would go after basically the king of Judah and he would lose his people. So he didn't want them to be tempted to return to the kings of Judah, so he set up this alternate religion. We read in 1 Kings 12, verse 28, so the king consulted and made two golden calves and he said to them, that is to the people, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold your gods, O Israel, that brought you up from the land of Egypt. That's exactly what they said when they made the golden calf at the foot of Mount Sinai after they came out of Egypt. Behold your gods, essentially behold your God. The word there is Elohim, the word that God uses to describe himself. So behold your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Now Jeroboam's 
idolatry laid the foundation for the ultimate downfall of Israel. This was the stumbling block that stumbled all the kings and all the people from that point on until the time of the captivity of the northern kingdom. When we turn away from the Lord, when we turn away from His worship, when we turn away from the way that the Lord wants us to live, it leads to our downfall, ultimately. Now, thankfully, if we belong to the Lord, He's not going to let us go too far down that path. I mean, He doesn't just keep us completely locked into the straight and narrow, although there are times when we wish that He would. It's even a prayer in one of the Psalms where it says, you know, that, that if we listen to the Lord and obey Him, then we won't have to be like the horse or the mule that need a bit and bridle to hold them in check. The Lord will apply the bit. He will put on the bridle. He will make sure we don't go too far. He's not going to let us go too far down that path before he brings us back to himself, as he did actually with Asa and as he did with Judah. Judah was going down the wrong path. The Lord was bringing them back. Now, here's the point. When the faithful in Israel, even though the, the kingdom got split, that doesn't mean everybody in the northern kingdom wanted to worship these golden calves. So when those who were in Israel who still loved the Lord and had regard for his worship heard what the Lord was doing in Judah, they began to migrate to the southern kingdom. And again, that's what God's grace does in our hearts. That's what his spirit does in our lives. He turns us away from the things that dishonor the Lord and he gives us a desire for the things that honor him and that it compels us internally to go in that direction, to go in the way that the Lord is honored. So we see people making this migration and that's why Baasha fortified Ramah, okay? He was determined to stop this migration. We read in 2 Chronicles 16.1, this was in our text, in the 36th year of Asa's reign, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and fortified Ramah in order to prevent anyone from going out or coming in to Asa, king of Judah. Now, if you look at a map, you'll see that Ramah essentially is between the, the two capitals of the two kingdoms, Samaria and Jerusalem, and it's on the main road, which connects the two, a frontier town, which was about six miles north of Jerusalem. Baasha turned it into a military station, posted soldiers there, fortified it against attack to stop the migration. And I imagine there were probably some economic advantages to doing this as well, so that the southern kingdom wouldn't become strong enough to overcome him. Now, he was apparently able to do this because he was helped by Ben-Hadad. Ben-Hadad, uh, by the way, is not necessary. He, he is a person, but that isn't his name. That, that is his title. This was a title used by the Syrian kings, and it essentially means the son of Hadad, and Hadad is a Syrian god. By the way, you've perhaps seen the name Abimelech in Scripture. And the word, the name Abimelech is not a name for a person. It's a title for a king. It's a title for the Philistine kings. And it means my father is king. Okay? So uh, these are titles. Now, Ben-Hadad was the king of Aram. And Aram is the Hebrew name for Syria. And this was the area that was even north and east of, um, of the northern kingdom. He was likely supplying Baasha with the materials and support that he needed to fortify Ramah. So think about this again. Baasha entered into an alliance with this heathen king in order to basically suppress uh, the southern kingdom. Here again, we have an unequal yoke. That unequal yoke doesn't apply just to marriage. It applies to treaties and alliances and partnerships that we enter into in the world as much as it applies to marriage. Whenever we get involved as believers, and Baasha apparently was not uh, a believer, but still he should have been because he was the king of God's people in the northern kingdom, right? Whenever we get into partnerships and treaties with those who don't love the Lord, we will run into trouble. And why do I say that? Because Ben-Hadad is going to, and we'll see in just a moment here, is going to break that treaty with Baasha and join with Asa, who shouldn't have joined with Ben-Hadad to begin with. Okay. So how does Asa deal with the blockade? And here's where the problem comes. He decides to take a political route. 
he bribes Ben-Hadad into breaking his treaty with Baasha, using the wealth that had been dedicated to the Lord's worship, the silver and the gold and the utensils and the things that he added to it that he had put in the temple treasuries. He now takes out and he bribes um, Ben-Hadad. We read in verses 2 and 3. Then Asa brought out silver and gold from the treasuries of the house of the Lord in the king's house and sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram. I always thought it was interesting. They always send the treasure ahead of time, expecting the person to do the right thing. You don't pay up front, you know, in today's world. Otherwise, you know what happens if you do that, okay? Anyway, he did that. So he sent them to Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, who lived in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me. As between my father and your father, behold, I have sent you silver and gold. Go break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. Now Ben-Hadad listens to Asa, breaks his covenant with Baasha, which is what the ungodly do, double cross, right? Which is one of the reasons we should not enter into contracts with them Uh, at least partnerships. I realize we do have to enter into contracts with people who don't know the Lord, but thankfully we do have some kind of a legal system that gives us a bit of recourse. But this particularly is a partnership. We need to make sure we don't rely on them for things that have to do with particularly the Lord. So he breaks his contract with Baasha. He attacks and he conquers Some of the cities that belonged to Baasha in Israel, the ones that were closest to him, the ones that would benefit him, he eats into Baasha's territory. And we read in verses 4 and 5, essentially, Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa, sent the commanders of his armies against the cities of Israel, and they conquered Aijan, Dan, Abel, Ma'am, and all the store cities of Naphtali. And when Baasha heard of it, he ceased fortifying Ramah and stopped his work. The next thing we see happens, Asa takes advantage of the situation. He brings the people of Judah. They go out to gather the building materials that were being used to fortify Ramah. And he fortifies two other cities or towns that were very close to Ramah to use them as further protection against Baasha. In other words, he uses them to his advantage. We read in verse 6. Then King Asa brought all Judah. They carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber with which Baasha had been building And with them, he fortified Geba and Mizpah, one a little bit further west, one a little bit further east, one a little bit further north, one a little bit further south along this road to strengthen his position against the king king of Israel. So Asa looks for a solution by entering into a covenant with a nation that betrays Israel. And the problem appears to be solved. He was even able to strengthen his position against Israel, and it seemed like everything was working out, okay? But things, as you know, were not as they seemed, because what Asa did dishonored the Lord. Solomon tells us in Proverbs 14, verse 12, there is a way that which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Remember how we saw earlier that we should not trust in our own wisdom. We shouldn't gather people around us who share the same opinion to strengthen our resolve to do what we really want to do. We need to listen to wisdom. God knows the right way, okay? And so the Lord sent his prophet to tell him. And we read this in verse 7. At that time, Hanani the seer, and by the way, seer is a prophet. Prophet is his office. Seer is what he does. Came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied, read trusted, on the king of Aram and have not relied, not trusted, on the Lord your God. Therefore, the army of the king of Aram has escaped out of your hand. So Asa's failure was basically that he looked to the king of Aram, he looked to the king of Syria for help. When he should have been looking to the Lord, he put his trust in man rather than in God. And he did this in light of what the Lord had already done for him and for Judah when he delivered him from this, this vast army that came against him. We read about this in verse 8. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubim an immense army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand because you relied on the Lord. Now the Lubim, those are basically the Libyans. They're, they're from Africa. 
and they attacked Judah with the Egyptians, who are also in Africa, and the Ethiopians, who were from Africa. When Rehoboam was king, there was, a, there was a, a war. But it's more likely that what Han and I had in mind here was the attack that took place in Asa's day, when he was outnumbered two to one by this, huge, this, this vast army. I thought it would be helpful to read about this because this is what the Lord had done for Asa the first time he was in trouble. And compare this threat with Baasha's threat and, and ask why would Asa do what he did in the second case. So this is what we read in Second Chronicles, I believe, 14, verses 8 through 13. Now Asa had an army of 300,000 from Judah bearing large shields and spears and 280,000 from Benjamin bearing shields and wielding bows. All of them were valiant warriors. Now Zerah the Ethiopian came out against them with an army of a million men and 300 chariots. That 300 chariots always seems to kind of strike me as being a small number of chariots, but apparently that was a large number of chariots, but a million men and 300 chariots, okay? And he came to Marishah. So Asa went out to meet him, and they drew up in battle formation in the valley of Zephathah at Marishah. Then Asa called to the Lord his God and said, Lord, there is no one besides you to help in the battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. So help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in you. And in your name have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Let not man prevail against you. So the Lord routed the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Asa and the people who were with him pursued them as far as Gerar. And so many Ethiopians fell that they could not recover, for they were shattered before the Lord and before his army. And they, that is Judah, carried away very much plunder. In the face of that threat, Asa trusted the Lord, and the Lord delivered him, and the Lord blessed him, and he blessed all of Judah, and he gave them a great amount of spoils. The Lord, he trusted the Lord, and the Lord didn't let him down. But whom did he trust when it came to Beasha? Now, Asa might have been happy with the short-term results of what happened. I mean, Beasha lost his blockade. Beasha died shortly after this event. Israel was weakened, and Beasha strengthened his position, excuse me, Asa against Beasha. But what did it cost him? Well, the wealth that he had taken from the Lord's treasuries, as well as some of his own, the prophet told him an enemy escaped, which was Aram, which he otherwise would have defeated. And he said, from this point on, you will have to face continual wars, Asa. Not only would Aram be a thorn now in your side, but the Lord is going to raise up others to discipline him until he learned to put his trust in the Lord rather than in man. Remember how I said before? A lesson we all need to learn, the Lord is going to continually challenge us and try us in certain areas until we eventually learn that lesson, okay? And he needed to learn the lesson to trust in the Lord and not in man, which is why these things were going to come against him. Sometimes we think of it purely in terms of just judicial punishment. You fail, therefore you get this. But we need to remember that God's relationship with Judah, with his people, is different than it is with the world. He disciplines He's trying to teach them something, to teach them to put their trust in him, and this would do exactly that. Now, the point is this, and this is where we're going to close. The Lord wants us to trust him. He wants us to trust him for our well-being. The prophet tells us, Hanani, in verse 9 of Second Chronicles 16, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his, those who are trusting in him. Now, this is the kind of person that the Lord is looking for. This is the kind of person that the Lord helps. This is the kind of person he wants us to be. This is really what he has made us and given us the possibility of being in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this evening, what we want to do is continue to look at this theme by considering what does it mean to trust in the Lord 
And how can we trust him more than we do? It is possible. All things are possible through the Lord because of his mercy and because of his grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not going to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and work this kind of courage and trust in ourselves, but the Lord will give us that ability if we look to him. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, uh, let's ask the Lord to search our hearts in this regard. And as we do this, let's also prepare to come to the table to celebrate the Lord's Supper because remember the death of Christ is the reason why we should trust the Lord. Remember what the Lord said on another occasion. If he was willing to give us his son, actually Paul said this to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, if he's willing to give us a son, how will he not with him also give us all things? So the Lord has already given us that which is most precious to him. He's paid the ultimate price to purchase these blessings for us. If he's going to give us him, won't he give us all things? Well, let's, let's think about that and let's ask the Lord to prepare us uh, to come to the table.